part of the impact of this process called corona is that I think we are faced with the fact that by the end of it all, virtually every major country on earth is going to be almost bankrupt. Well, folk, here is my next conversation with a tough mind and tender heart. And I was be working my way through a book by Father Anthony Egan called God's Universe, Our Responsibility. So I thought, well, he has a chance for me to get a really, really tough mind <laughs> into this conversation. Um, Anthony has, I think I counted five degrees. He has two honors degrees, two master's degrees and a PhD. So Anthony, welcome and thank you for making time. Can I call you an eco-theologian or do you need to have another degree to be called that? Uh, yeah, thanks John. My own journey was uh rather circuitous route. I had planned to be an advocate. So I started off with a BA in history and English and then legal subjects. And somewhere along the line, I decided I wasn't going to be a lawyer. I was going to be a historian. And so I developed a deep interest in history and I majored in history at Cape Town back in the 80s Then did honors and masters in history at Cape Town. And while I was there, I got involved with the Catholic Student Movement. It was then called NCFS, National Catholic Federation of Students. Mm. And from there, I got to know the Jesuits. I always jokingly say that my, my knowledge of the Jesuits before that had been based on three things. Reading history, which was fascinating when you look at the history of the Jesuits. Having a Jesuit high school teacher, who is now my next door neighbor, in my community, mm. uh, and you will you will laugh at this. Watching at the age of thirteen, uh, an illegal bootleg VHS copy of a then banned film back then in the nineteen eighty called The Exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can see the kind of strange eclectic route that I took. Now, in the nineteen eighties, I. Suppose I developed an interest in the society that was based upon the work well, they were doing, particularly among students and, and involvement in the sort of pastoral support of students, a lot of them deeply involved in the whole student activist scene of the 1980s, the end conscription campaign, the student movement, those sort of things. And slowly but surely, I developed an interest. And then I started thinking, well, what, what's all the stuff about retreats? And so I went on a few little retreats here and then, and then I just got to know the Jesuits. It was a slow process where I came to see that what I was interested in seemed to be what the Jesuits were doing. Uh, the spirituality that I was embracing was what the Jesuits were doing. I joined the society in 1990. And then, of course, be, you know, we are we're notoriously slow learners. Uh, we went through a long process of, of formation. Uh, that we did, and I was ordained in 2002. Hmm. So, so 12 years. years. As I said, we're slow learners. <laughs> well, I've always been somewhat intimidated by Jesuits because of that 12 year formation process. <laughs> but to come to the topic, Anthony, that I pose, I mean, is the universe friendly? It's a question which apparently was posed to Albert Einstein. He thought it was. But we now live in a situation where. It's, it's not difficult to understand why people might feel that we live in a hostile universe that's out to get us. I mean, I think what Einstein was saying when he said that was something along the lines of, you know, the universe is, is infinitely more complex than we imagine. And in a sense, as I posit in this book that I, that I wrote, quite controversially perhaps, that the universe is in some ways part of God. The universe is the universe, and we're actually part of it, because as human beings, we must, uh, we must literally sort of hope that the universe understands us. I think that's what we are looking for, uh, that, that, and then that God understands us. And I think that would be clear, that there is a connection between the universe and us and God and us, and that is, more, I think, more important to say than friendly, that the universe has a reason and a logic and a process to it that 
that we can actually try and understand, and not just in a physical sense. Mm. And I think this is where we get ourselves caught up, that, 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 that we, re we reduce everything to our own human understanding. Yeah. Um, I think one of the great temptations that we face, particularly in this time of coronavirus, is to imagine that we're living in a totally hostile world. And I think the language of hostility is something that we must be wary of. And I wonder if there's not the deeper lesson within this coronavirus pandemic to say we've got to get ourselves re-recognizing that going back to normal isn't going back to a capitalist, exploitative, extractive approach to economics. And, and how do we recover the economics of Jesus? Jesus doesn't talk too much about the environment per se. Well, he doesn't talk too much about sex per se. But what he does talk a lot about is money it's and economics justice. and social injustice. It's a very real thing. I mean, part of the impact of this process called Corona is that I think we are faced with the fact that by the end of it all, virtually every major country on earth is going to be almost bankrupt. Mm. So they'll have to start thinking again. We'll have to rethink our whole economic system. I was greatly helped by my friend Manfred Max Nieff. You know, and I think I've given you a copy of my book. He, he found this wonderful symbol on a Viking runestone, which is very much a Trinitarian symbol. He saw within it nature, humanity and technology in balanced, harmonious synergy, we none overwhelm the other. I think it's a real tension between those three, nature, technology, and humanity. If we emphasize humanity and protect humanity at all costs in the coronavirus, we'll literally go back, we'll have no economy left, we'll, we'll be left with nothing. If we, if we follow the idea of follow nature, accept nature, I was listening to this on the questions of how the coronavirus works, and all I could think was, you know, not so much of, ooh, but rather, you're a clever little bugger. Yeah. You really are. Yeah. It's a clever little virus. I, I, I respect it. Yeah. If we respect nature completely, we will allow, basically, humanity to, to be extinct. Yeah. If we embrace technology, I mean, we will, without considering the, the other aspects, yeah. uh, technology will simply replace us because we will become useless. Mm -hmm. We will have no use. Everything will be better run by machines. So in a sense, we have to try and see how within that we use technology to improve our lives and to improve nature without damaging and destroying uh, nature in the process. And that's a tricky part, isn't it? I, I think for me, one of the things that I've learned, and I mean, in a sense, I've learned it, through both the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius, but also through other sort of journeys of prayer and particularly the sort of, shall we say, sort of Buddhist style prayer and its Western appropriation by people like John Mayne and Lawrence Freeman, is that you sometimes have to just be silent. Now, you, you're a historian, so let's talk a bit about from history. What parallels can we draw from in trying to come to terms with what's happening today? Is this something that history can teach us? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a yes and no answer. I mean, no, history doesn't repeat itself exactly every time. I mean, that, that we have to put aside. But yes, I think we can learn from different experiences of the past. Um, when I was very privileged in the 80s to be taught by a historian in South Africa is probably one of about you know, about 20 or 30 historians around the world who specialized in the great influenza epidemic mm. of you know, 1918 to 21, Howard Phillips. Mm. And he looked at the experience of the great influenza epidemic in South Africa itself. That was his doctoral thesis in his first book. And it helps you to see the way in which we both moved forward from where we were but at the same time stuck, stuck in the past. I mean, in many ways, the spread of the influenza epidemic was far, far slower than what we've had with COVID-19. I mean, COVID-19 uh, sort of surfaced, what, with November, December last year, and now by April, less than six months, uh, we basically have a worldwide pandemic. 
Spanish influenza slowly started, popped up. There's even a debate about where it started. Some people will say it started in, in Southeast Asia. Some people say, I think it started in, in the American Midwest on a military base next door to a farm where there were pigs that were contaminated by some, some virus and that it had passed on to the soldiers. And the soldiers being shipped out to the Western Front sort of spread it to the other troops and then it just spread. But it took time because our global communications networks nowadays are so, so uh, more sophisticated. You know, we had, uh, we had it in a few months, in literally about shorter time. Uh, and the other thing about it that's interesting, of course, is the way in which many mindsets and attitudes we hear again today, particularly fear and all the kinds of political attitudes and, and, and game playing that we see happening around the world. More positively, and perhaps most positively, today we are far more scientifically sophisticated and we're already starting to look at prototypes to develop um, vaccines and stuff like that. The moment the disease started, scientists were, were there starting to work on trying to find ways of fixing the problem, which, you know, at the end of a world war, tail end of a world war, and with a less sophisticated scientific knowledge, people didn't have. I also think it's interesting to note this from, from our perspective as people of faith, the way in which the whole religious communities responded to Spanish flu. Mm -hmm. We had the same story going on that we've heard at nauseum in the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. The issue of whether you close the church down or whether you carry on the service. If you close the church down, is it a lack of faith? Are you, are you not trusting in God enough? Uh, sort of on the wildest and wackiest fringes of religion, people thinking that they have some kind of you know, magical spiritual cure to, to uh, either exorcise or heal um, the disease. Now, that was Spanish flu. Now let's jump back another 400 years, 500 years, to the 14th century, to the plague to the Black Death. Now, this is an interesting one in that it had probably the highest casualty rate ever in Europe. I mean, I don't think anything killed off Europe more than the Black Death. Mm. And the Europeans, you know, let's forget the nice civilized and pacifist type people they are today, were pretty, you know, homicidally mad uh, under, you know, successions of mad kings in the 14th century. So they were used to, to mass death. But one in three Europeans die in the Black Plague. Yeah. And the plague becomes a kind of expression that almost stymies the religious community. Mm. Um, they, they, they are decimated by, by, by disease. In fact, it's not so much decimated, and that's something like one in five priests and monks in Europe died. So even those, in, apparently whole monasteries were wiped out. The plague arrived. Now, today we know a lot more than they did in the 14th century. We understand things, basic things like hygiene. I hope you know. Once again, it's the same theme we have today. But the other thing we have in, in, the, in the plague is a kind of theology that, that saw this disease, which remember, it's, no one really knows where it's coming from. They've not really worked out where it is. Or, you know, what is it? Where is it? You know? And, and they believe there's all kinds of diabolical forces at work or divine uh, justice, divine punishment for sin and all those kind of things, which luckily I think we have, we've moved away from in the 21st century. And I think that's because we've, uh, we've come to a deeper understanding of and reached a kind of good working relationship with science. We have all basically agreed on the same, more or less on the same, scientific basis, scientific situation. And so we move beyond the, the temptation to blame to the, the invitation to collaborate between science and religion and particularly the Christian churches um, in uh, combating what we accept is a disease. Mm. The irony of it all was the plague killed feudalism. Yeah. Think about it. One third of all people were dead. So the space, the space that people had, for example, in the past to escape from the land, 
where they were held as virtual slaves called serfs. Uh, that was something that um, it was, you know, it was seen to be in inevitable uh, until there were very few people left. Because what happened? You were a serf, you ran away from my land, you ran to another piece of land, and the, basically the lord of the manor sent you back to me because because he and I are, are mates. Uh, now there are so few people going around to work the land, they have to start thinking about new developments, how to how to farm again, how to, how to how to sort of rebuild the economy, and they just don't have the people left. So the paradox of the sort of the terror of the Great Death was that it probably created the rise of capitalism, mm. uh, which was a step away from feudalism. Uh, you know, and obviously that created its own problems. Mm. Uh, but you know, every every time history moves forward, we we see that you know there's there's always going to be a mixed pro and con to every kind of new development. And uh, I don't know if you've read Yuval Noah Harari. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, Homo Deus, the next stage of our evolution, this uh, rise of the machine. Some people are almost saying the sort of development of the human machine synthesis, transhumanism. And that's going to be a really interesting problem. Uh, now with that, the rise of a new economy after this global pandemic mm. it sounds harsh to say it but the more the more people die in the pandemic and the more the economies of the world are ruined the more likely that they, they'll have to start thinking anew that or they essentially start a new imperial period where you simply annex territory and enslave the locals and so essentially what you have for a series of rampaging warlords around the planet. So, I mean, there's no guarantee what answer there is because his, history, as I say, doesn't repeat itself. But it raises very interesting questions. It does. And, but you talk of yourself in your book as a residual Marxist. <laughs> now, what does your crystal ball say? What will be the, the relationship between capital and labor in the, after this pandemic? I don't know. It's a very complicated one. I mean, essentially, up until now, talking globally, labor is on the, on the back burner. They have been pushed to the margins. It sounds cynical to say it depends how many people and which classes die. But some of those outcomes could be very bleak. Machines in factories don't catch coronavirus. Mm. Humans do. So let's replace humans with machines. Mm. And uh, as we, if we follow this hypothesis of the rise of smart machines and robotic machinery and computers, and I mean, let's be honest, the, our technology has helped us to, in a sense, isolate the problem of the coronavirus way ahead of what happened in 1918 or indeed in 1348. So we are becoming more and more connected to our machines. Look, look at the way we are conversing at the moment on a, on a computer. Uh, this was the stuff of science fiction mm. back in the 1950s and 60s. Mm. I mean, our cell phone was pioneered by Star Trek. So technology may well be much stronger, uh, and that will inevitably align it with whoever has control of technology. Mm. And uh, so that would put, put labor in the back, back burner. So I don't have an answer. I mean, but there are lots of problems. Yeah. questions we haven't resolved. Can we go two, two centuries earlier, because St. Francis of Assisi, and this then leads me to the whole connection between what we can learn from the coronavirus and the global environmental challenges we face. Looking at the life of St. Francis of Assisi, and who is the patron saint of Italy, as also the patron saint of animals and the environment, um, and somebody who I believe inaugurated a sort of an ecological consciousness. Does he have a message that we need to hear in terms of finding a coherence with the natural world that we live in? My sense of Francis is that firstly, he's the classic example of someone who rebels from his social environment. You know, he was in that kind of merchant class and he, he walked away from it. Uh, and he developed a deep spirituality, a deep sense of prayer. I think what he did when he, he engaged with the, the environment, you know, the, the famous sort of canticle of Brother Sun, uh, that, that canticle really is about finding God in creation itself. 
And I think this, is, this was a major step forward, although I must also point out that if you look into a lot of the mystical sides of early Christianity, there is a deep sense of connection. Um, I mean, think of, for example, of the, the so-called desert fathers and mothers uh, from Egypt and Syria and those sort of Middle Eastern places. They went into the desert because they could find God in the desert. And it's, in a sense, the desert purges you of all your complacency in the sort of sensual reality around you because it's spare, it's empty. You are confronted with an emptiness and the emptiness either makes you feel profoundly empty or you find there is the sort of presence of God in the midst of emptiness. Mm. And, and, I, and I would almost put Francis in that tradition. He goes into nature in order to find God in a deeper way. And yes, obviously, he is the patron saint of environment and ecology. He's cared for, you know, talking to the fishes and all that stuff, birds and fishes. But I think we must not turn that into some kind of sentimentality. Mm. I think we have to see it as a, the mystic's way of connecting to God in all things. Mm. Ignatius was influenced by that as well. And one of the Ignatian contemplations that, that he uses is to find God in all things. There's also this wonderful contemplation of the three divine persons, as Ignatius puts it. So the Holy Trinity, looking upon the earth, seeing everything on the earth, seeing the human beings wandering around and seeing how we human beings are making a complete hash of things. I could just imagine them sitting there going, oy vey, oy vey, what are they doing? What are they doing? What are we going to do about it? And, and one of them says, I'll go. Yeah. And in a sense, it's, it's that, that's, that's, that's how Ignatius gets you to imagine incarnation. Mm. Uh, why does God enter into our human existence mm. in the person of Jesus? And then we go into the story of Jesus from there. Mm. I mean, our great danger, I think, as Christians is that we reduce our whole spirituality to the book of scriptures. Mm. And we forget there's also the book of nature. If we think about Jesus himself, when he begins his ministry, where does he go? He goes to the desert. Uh, and there's this kind of complex relationship with nature that, that we all have, that I think is mirrored in the life of Jesus as we've read in scripture. I mean, I find deserts, for example, tra walk, driving through it, the Kalahari one, one day uh, on route somewhere. And I was just all too aware of the fact that I was like a little dot of nothing in this vast space. That everything around you is living and breathing. What may seem strange and alien and empty like a desert is in fact filled with a kind of life and energy. It did two things. One, it cured me of any sense of disconnection from the world around me. And secondly, it also helped me to see something in a more um, long-term light. You know, it sounds strange, you know, you think as someone who trained as a historian, I would have thought of the long, the long durée, if you use the, 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 the French term, the sense of the long picture. But we often, as human beings, see everything just from our immediate world, from our own experiences, from our own limitations, fears, risk, suffering, all that stuff. And the result is we, we become almost sort of obsessed with our, our own selves and our own histories. Mm -hmm. And by looking at it from a much bigger perspective, you can see that you're part of something much greater, and yet you have a place. Mm -hmm. And you are connected. And you know, for people of religious faith, that would also give me a sense of, of connection to God, of something deeper than, than, than just the material world. Because I think, but there is that sort of sense of mystery. Mm. And of course, if we read the Psalms, the Psalms are full of that sort of coming to a deeper understanding of a mysterious divine presence, which, is, which kind of hovers. Mm. We cannot on our own conceive of this mystery uh, without the help of others and without realizing that much of the time we're bluffing. And without the help of poetry. Uh, you're a poet. Absolutely. Literature. Yes. You're Manny Hopkins, who was a Jesuit poet. Oh, yes. And, and I think that's what makes you not just a tough mind, a tender heart. 
one can't really be a poet without it connecting not from the pure rational cognitive it comes down to the level of feeling maybe we can end off with you reading so this poem is the sort of preface to chapter six which sort of roughly coincides with with the passion week it basically juxtaposes the, the crucifixion of christ and the crucifixion of the earth called Gaian reproaches gaia goes to her golgotha atop the heaped plastic water bottles junked laptops dirty diapers and other dregs of the anthropocene revolution the fish caught almost to depletion choke upon raw sewage pumped into the sea the effluent of the affluent who are giving gaia the middle finger again and again and her Amazon and Congo arteries are clogged, with waste her lifeblood clotted. From the wounds in her strip mine side belches methane and smog, her body lashed with repeated laceration, each slash another species gone. When she cries in stormy revolt of super hurricanes flooding and drought, God help her delinquent children.